In this episode of Conducting Fields, we'll dive into the last movement of Brahms' first symphony. Hi, I'm Jamera Grillo, I'm a conductor and a composer, and welcome to the new episode of Conducting Fields, a series where we look into a classical piece or a part of it and outline its structure and phrasing, orchestration and harmony, with the bonus technical tips for conductors. I want to take a second to remind you that on my website you can find now more than 80 videos between score and technical analysis, the full episodes of Conducting Pills on top of the live sessions and plenty of other material. And now, let's start. Brahms himself declared that his first symphony, from sketches to finishing touches, took 21 years, from 1855 to 1876. Brahms was extremely self-critical and destroyed many of his early compositions. On a second but not a secondary note, there was the big shadow cast by Beethoven. Brahms often felt he could not measure up the Beethoven's inheritance. The final structure of the symphony most likely took form around 1868. Brahms ended up using in the outer movements the quintessential form of classicism, the sonata form, a structure based on an exposition with two contrasting themes, a development and a recapitulation, everything framed by an introduction and a coda. By the way, the very first two episodes of Conducting Pills were centered on the first movement of this symphony, and you can find them right here. As with the first movement, Brahms begins with an introduction in C minor. The grandiosity of the musical gesture gives us a taste of what's to come. Three descending notes in the low strings and the contrabassoon open the doors to an anticipation of a theme that we will recognize a little later. The atmosphere is dark and ominous, and the drama is exacerbated by the timpani roll in crescendo to fortissimo. Notice also the swells in the second and third bar. The music becomes tentative. The strings in pizzicato tiptoe around each other, and things get more exciting through a crescendo and a stringendo. And we're back to square one. The three descending notes are now in the hands of the woodwinds, while the ominous anticipation of the future first theme goes to the violins and violas. The pizzicato returns shortened, leading to another reprise of the first three notes. The answer in the ascending scales of the violas and cellos is transformed in the section that follows. This is quintessential Brahms transforming the same material over and over again. The scales increase the temperature, climbing up high only to be disrupted and fall down again. And then again. The final bars of this adagio explode in the temporary roll, leading to a più andante. The dark mood of the first part of this introduction makes a 360 degrees turn. This always gives me the idea of the sun coming out of the clouds. Brahms shifts to C major and the alt horn themes resonates in the horns. The stage is left to the flute, playing the same theme. At letter C, we enter four bars of a seemingly Lutheran chorale. And the alt horn theme is back, bouncing between horns and flutes, ending this long introduction on a dominant seventh chord. This introduction is, technically speaking, a very difficult passage. The pizzicatas of the beginning require great dexterity in switching from a subdivided to an unsubdivided stroke, as well as a slower baton speed at certain moments, like on bar 12, to allow for the natural breathe that the music demands. The entire vision of the musical arch is fundamental to make this music come alive and not sound mechanical. The first theme, broad, grandiose, is introduced by the violins, playing on their lowest strength, conferring a warm tone to it. The viola's counterpoint, while the horns gently sustain the harmony. The rhythmic engine is left to the pizzicato of the cellos and double basses. The 
thing is passed to the woodwinds and the texture enriched by the timpani moving with the pizzicato of the low strings. The theme is then retaken a third time by the full orchestra, which begins its disruption. The eternal presence of conflicts, which we've seen so much of in the first movement, returns here as well for a brief moment. The bridge to the second theme contains a reminder of the Alphorn theme. The second theme is strictly related both to the very opening of the movement and its descending figure and to the Halphorn tune. Again, the strings introduce the theme and are shortly joined by the woodwinds. An energetic transitional passage shows once more the inner conflicts and then the oboe continues. The exposition continues with a series of conflicts and their resolution in a constant shift of dynamics and orchestration. The rhythm intensifies the action turning to triplets, which gradually take over. Oddly enough, we end up on the relative minor of G major, E minor, concluding the exposition. The development section begins with a full restatement of the first theme. This is the last time that this theme is presented in its entirety. The woodwinds punctuate the theme, played by the violins, while the counterpoint of the violas is now doubled by the cellos. The oboe leads the transition to E flat major, where the woodwinds try to take the theme from the strings. But the conversation is immediately interrupted by the pizzicato of the strings, strictly related to the pizzicato in the first bars of the introduction. The entire development is actually a combination of both development and recapitulation, mixing up themes and sectional parts and leading directly to the coda. The first theme pops up in forte, but it's immediately disrupted, landing on the conflict air we heard in the exposition, which led to the second theme. Only the conflict here is not resolved right away, but keeps growing and growing through a series of modulating passages. We're reaching the climax. The Alphorn theme is transformed in a very dramatic sequence. Finally, exploding full orchestra fortissimo, where the serenity of the C major is gradually restored. We land on the second theme directly. The second theme is reinstated with little variations and leads to the long coda, starting in C minor. And eventually landing on a C major. The Pew Allegro reintroduces the chorale section we heard in the introduction. and triumphantly ends the symphony with a pair of plagal cadences. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button right below the video and click the bell so you will get notified every time a new video comes out. For more in-depth analysis, conducting technique and conducting exercises, log on my website and follow my Facebook group. All the links are in the description. Let me know in the comments what you think about this piece and if you have any suggestions for future videos and I look forward to seeing you next week with a new episode of Conducting Pills when we will start going through Mozart's Symphony No. 36, also known as the Linz Symphony. In the meanwhile, please continue to enjoy music and be well. Ciao! Things you need to keep in mind are the spacing of your strokes, the speed 
of the baton. Subdivisions versus no subdivision. Keep the subdivision very subtle, always within a legato click, depending on the tempo you 